notice the title of the message today? Yeah. <laughs> Where's your crystal ball? I was thinking I needed one of those hats like Johnny Carson used to have. And <laughs> I think I told you this story back when I'm with, we were in college. Um, you know, I, I think I just mentioned that a couple weeks ago. I read a book, a commentary by a fellow that was saying there will be a nation of Israel, and I looked at the date, and he he said that in 1988, 60 years before the nation of Israel came into being, and he was able to prophesy because he. Did I, did I say 98, 1988, excuse me, 1888, I was only 100 years off, and so I want to point that out, um, 1888, 60 years before uh, Israel was formed, and he was able to speak prophetically, and I'm going to speak prophetically to you today, and I want to read the passage, and then I want to give a couple, actually, my introductions, half the sermon, but I, I, I want to uh, say a couple things about praise, worship, and thanksgiving. But first of all, let's read the chapter, Isaiah 12. And I want to remind you, this is following after uh, what he said in chapter 11 about the millennial reign of Christ, but we look forward to when the future unfolds as the Bible tells us. The millennial reign of Christ is when Jesus reigns upon the earth for a thousand years. And, uh, and then uh, there will be a time of rebellion, but then the new heaven and new earth is formed. And we talked about how fantastic that's going to be. And we talked about the fact that it sounds so wonderful. It sounds like a fantasy. But the thing is, we can know it's true because the scripture always calls for us to have faith that is based on facts. And we look at some of the fulfilled prophecy of chapter 11. But right now, I'm going to prophesy to you out of chapter 12. It says, then you will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. Who will? You will. Now, Granted, I know Isaiah was speaking to the nation of Israel, but actually the nation of Judah, but he was talking about things that are going to include us, and I'm just going to share with you, I believe prophetically, that we can include ourselves in this Thanksgiving because we will be there. We will be there. If you've trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, now I know all of you, and I love you, and, I, and pretty much everybody here has professed faith in Christ, but only God knows each of our hearts. You know, and I've heard so many stories about people who have been church members for years and years and years. And we know that being a church member is not the basis of salvation. We know that a relationship with Jesus Christ, receiving him as Lord and Savior, putting your faith and trust in him, is what includes us into the happiness that the, the choir sang about this morning. Happy, happiness is to know the Lord. And when we know him, we will be included in all of these things about the future. And because we will, you will be there. And because you will, then you will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. For although you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. When was God angry with us? God was angry with us when we were in our sin. And he wasn't really, I mean, he didn't hate us because we were in our sin. He hated the sin that stained us. But because of Christ, his anger is turned away, and now he comforts us. Behold, God is my salvation. How many of you can say that? Hopefully everybody here can say, Behold, God is my salvation. Let's say that together. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and song. Now, the thing is, this is talking about the future. And it says that we will say these things, and he has become my salvation. Now, see, I can say that now if I trusted Jesus, but I will say it fully then. I have not yet been fully saved. 
I'm saved as far as completely forgiven of my sins, but I have not yet experienced my salvation. None of us have. In fact, the Bible says that we hope for those things, and you don't hope for things that you already see, right? You hope for things that you haven't seen yet. I haven't seen my salvation. I don't even know how good it's going to be, and neither do you. We talked last week about some things. I shared something with you that some people would say, now that's just silly. I talked about riding on a dinosaur. But have you thought about that? Was I logical in what I said? If God is going to make all things new, the old earth and the old heaven have been destroyed, don't you think that the new earth is going to include everything that he originally put in the earth? And I believe that we'll have that opportunity. Now, you might think, Pastor, you're crazy. Maybe you disagree with the scriptural evidence. There is not a Bible verse that talks about riding a dinosaur. But I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> and so it says at the end of verse 2, And he has become my salvation. Therefore, you will joyously draw from the waters the springs of salvation. And in that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, make them remember that his name is exalted. Praise the Lord in song, for he has done excellent things. Let this be made known throughout the earth, Cry aloud and shout for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Thank you, Linda. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Amen. Why is it that I'm always repeating things and saying and pausing? Because I'm hoping you will what? Uh, respond. respond. I'm hoping you'll respond. You know, pastors are always trying to get their people to respond. Now, some churches, I have to grant you, some pastors want everybody quiet. There is a place for reverence, and I don't think that we should ever be re irreverent in God's presence. But I want you to notice the things that the Bible says that God actually calls for us to do. Sing. Shout. Yes. It even says to dance. It says to cry out to the Lord, to clap our hands. Basically, God is trying to get us involved in worshiping him. I want to share with you. I have some major doctrinal differences with our Pentecostal brothers and sisters. But I love the way they worship. I love the way they worship. I was part of a Baptist church in Reading that worshiped like a Pentecostal church. We didn't have tongues in our service, but people responded. And people got involved. And the thing is, we affect each other in how we respond. Every single one of us has an effect on the others. In fact, the Bible tells us that the body is built up by what the joints supply, the relationships. In other words, everything that we do affects each other. Has anybody ever done something that caused your spiritual life to go through a very low time? Has anybody ever done something that lifted your heart? We all have an effect on each other. Now, I, I've already said this was spoken to Israel, but these are things that we will have a part in. So I'm just going to talk about this chapter as though it were addressed to us. Because like I said, Israel existed in the day that Isaiah was talking. We didn't yet. Except for one, and I'm not going to mention who it was. Gene. I, I, <laughs> Gene's not that old. Okay, so I, I just want you to know, nobody here was present when Isaiah was speaking, and the revelation of the New Testament hadn't been given yet, but we will be involved in the millennial reign of Christ. We will be involved in the new heaven and new earth. 
if we have trusted Jesus, we will share in those things. So the things that he's saying apply to us. And as we consider these things, I want to just generalize for just a second. Because everything that he has described here, we would bring under the category of worship and praise and thanksgiving. And I want to just say three things about worship and praise and thanksgiving. Number one, it's powerful. Write that in your notes. It's powerful. It's powerful. In 2 Chronicles 20, 21 and 22, this talks about something in the history of Israel. There was a battle going on, and this was under Jehoshaphat. I, I, I don't know if you remember this, but I told uh, Brother A.W. and Pat that if they ever had another child, I wanted them to name it Jehoshaphat. Uh, and they didn't cooperate with me. I, that was kind of heartbreaking to me. But anyway, it, it goes on. Under Jehoshaphat, there was a battle, and it says, When he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire as they went out before the army and said, Give thanks to the Lord, for his loving kindness is everlasting. When they began singing and praising the Lord, uh, when they began singing and praising, pause, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Nasser, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. Now, this was not the way they always did battle, but God, for some reason, caused them to go out into battle this way. Who led the way? The singers and praisers. They were fighting a battle against the enemies of the Lord, and the front line was the people who were praising God. Amen. What does that say to you? Do you need a preacher to explain the spiritual truth of that? Do you need me to line it out for you? What is he saying there? Somebody explain it. Somebody knows who's winning. <laughs> <laughs> the fact is, if you want to win the battle, if you want to be victorious for the Lord, you need to praise him. You need to worship him. Why? Because when we worship God, we see how great he is. We acknowledge him in all your ways. Acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. He'll open the way. He'll lead the way. It says that the praisers, the singers, the thankers, they led the way into battle, and when they praised God, God's people were victorious. Do you think that we can be victorious without praising God? Can we be victorious without honoring Him, without worshiping Him, without thanking Him? No, we can't. It is powerful to be thankful to the Lord. It's also good and appropriate. It's good and appropriate. Write that down. It's good and appropriate. And I just realized that I, in my notes, I think I corrected it in your notes. I hope I did. Psalm 147.1 was supposed to come right after that point. It is good and appropriate to praise God. Psalm 147.1 says, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. It is pleasant, and praise is becoming. It's becoming what? It's attractive. Okay. It's, it's becoming... It's attractive. Addictive. It's appropriate. It, pardon me? Addictive. <laughs> it's addictive, too. When you really praise God, it makes you want to praise Him more. I want to talk to you about the fact that there is a verse. There is a verse that says that God inhabits the praises of His people. I, I need to share one other one with you. Look at Psalm 33.1. Again, I, I don't know if these are in the right order in your notes. But Psalm 33.1, you can see it according to uh, the, the identification, the reference there. It says, Sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. This is one of those terms. I mean, language is constantly changing, right? And... We think in terms of becoming, like I said, becoming what? Like one thing is changing to another. 
But the word here means it's appropriate. It's lovely. It's, it's what ought to be. What? It's pleasing. It's, it's pleasing. It's beautiful. When, pardon me? It's a good look for us. It's a good look for us. God's people need that look. We need the look of praise. We need the look of worship. And the thing is, it's appropriate. If God is as good as he is, then what should we be doing? We should be praising him. We should be honoring him. We, we should be thanking him. And then I want you to write down, it's what we should be doing. Well, if it's good and appropriate, then it's what we should be doing. And this is where the verse, I, I have used this phrase many times, and I looked it up, and I actually came across this huge article uh, in the King James Version, Psalm 22, verse 3 says, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. And from that verse, this is the phrase that I've heard many times, and I've also said it myself. God inhabits the praises of his people. How many of you have heard that? All right, thank you. I read this huge article where this guy, this worship leader was saying, you know what, I really wish it said that, but I don't really think it said that. Uh, and he went into great detail. He talked about all the different kinds of poetry and meter and, and beats in the, in the poetry of the Hebrew. And he was just saying that it's more common, it's common in the scripture for uh, the Bible to say, uh, God is enthroned in holiness, or God inhabits, he lives in holiness, and therefore we should praise him. And he said, you know, God inhabiting the praises of his people, that's not really an accurate interpretation. They, here's what it says in the New American Standard. Yet you are holy, O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. And, and so he was basically saying, you know, I love that saying, but it's not really good biblical interpretation. Well, let me just say to you, let's look at what Jesus said in Matthew 18, 20. He said, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Well, when Christians get together then and they're praising God, who happens to be there? He's here. I mean, we know that God is omnipresent anyway, right? Hey, when you go home today, is God going to be with you? You bet he is. He is omnipresent. We know that the Holy Spirit lives where? He lives inside of us. And when God, when Jesus said that when we gather in his name, when one person who's got the Holy Spirit living in him meets another person who has the Holy Spirit living in her, and they come into the presence of an omnipresent God, and Jesus says, oh, by the way, when you get together, I'm there in a special way. Do you think it's all right to say God inhabits the praises of his people? Amen. Go study your Hebrew poetry and meter. That's fine. But you don't have to depend on that one verse. When we praise him, he is here in a special way. Amen. And there is nothing more powerful than praising God with all of your heart. I want you to be aware. Psalm 32, 11 says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy. Amen. Shout for joy, all you who are, are upright in heart. It also says in Philippians 4, 4, let's move to the New Testament. Rejoice in the Lord. What's the next word? Always. Always. Again, I will say, rejoice. He says it again. Why? For emphasis. Rejoice. Always. And again, I'm going to say, rejoice. Rejoice. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 says, rejoice. Always. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In what? Everything. Everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And so the Bible says that we should rejoice, we should be glad, 
we should sing, we should praise him. And so I'm going to do something a little bit different. This, this scripture talks about singing and praising God. Have you ever noticed in the old days that uh, in the bulletin, I, I forgive me, Linda, I don't even know for sure what it says in our bulletin today. I didn't look to see or remember, but the first song was always called the what? Call to worship. Why was it called that? Because it was calling God's people to come and worship. We want to worship the Lord. What kind of service has this traditionally been called? The, the worship service. And yet, what has it become through time? It has become the preaching service, the singing service, and worship sometimes gets forgotten. Worship is an interaction not between me and you alone, but between me and God, between you and God, between us and God. It is God pointed when we worship. It's not us relating just between ourselves. It is us relating to God together. And so I want to share with you a little call to worship song. And it asks you to do, I'm going to ask you to do a couple of the things that we looked at. It's, I'm going to ask you to clap your hands. Everybody do this on a count of three. One, two, three. Very good. You guys did that really very well. And let's do it again. Okay, now I want us to do it four times. Now I want us to do it four times syncopated. It goes like this. Okay, want to try that with me? Okay, you're ready. Go ahead and, I think this is the place where I have it, isn't it? Go ahead and put the words up there. Can, can they hear me okay? Uh -oh. Got a little music starting? Wait for it. somebody is thinking, well, Pastor, if I felt more like it, I'd do it. Can I just say something to you? If you do it, you'd feel more like it. The fact is, in fact, I, want, I see several of you doing this already. I want you to give me the biggest, brightest smile you can right now. You laughed. Why did you laugh, Patsy? I didn't ask you to laugh. Why? Because <laughs> smiling makes you feel better. It makes you feel good. What we do, here's the problem. Oftentimes, we do according to what we feel. But the Bible teaches us we should learn to feel according to what we do. 
If we do what's right, it will change the way that we feel. Amen. If we worship God, it will change the way that we feel. Now, Pastor, I tried that once and it didn't work right away. It doesn't always change things right away. But the fact is that what we do changes what we feel. And hear this passage. I want to read this to you. And I want you to note. Fill in the notes. This is what this passage says you will do. First of all, you will give thanks. I want you to look back up here. Look at verse 1. Then you will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. Amen. Where are you going to find yourself? You are, whether you're talking about the millennium, that means you're going to find yourself on earth with Jesus actually reigning, and we will be reigning with him. And sure, when we're there, it's going to be easy to say, I will give you thanks, O Lord. But, Lord, but Pastor, you don't understand the circumstance I'm in right now. Well, okay, let me just, let's look at this passage. It is talking about when we're there with him. Whether it's talking about the millennium or whether you talk about the new heaven and new earth, it's going to be wonderful. And it says these things, you will give thanks. And it's not a demand. Sometimes, honestly, when pastors say you need to do this or you need to do that, we kind of feel like it's the, uh, it's the little... A uh, poster that I saw hanging in an office that said, the beatings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> That's not what this is. This is not saying, thank God, praise. No, it's saying, it's a, it's a statement of fact. It, you will praise God. You will be surrounded by God's presence. The Bible says that we will see the glory of God. And what will we do? We will give him thanks. And I'll just relate it to you this way because uh, sometimes thanksgiving is a sacrifice. That's, by the way, in the book of Peter it says that we are a kingdom of priests and we are called to give the, the sacrifice of thanksgiving. That doesn't mean that you need to bring something to church and burn it or something like that. It just means that sometimes it's difficult to give thanks. But it's telling us here, you will not be able to help yourself. And, and I, I can't help it. There have been times like this in different circumstances, but the one that fits in my mind the most. most. How many of you have ever heard the second chapter of Acts? It's a music group. One? Brother Dale's the only one that's heard? This is a music group that came out of the hippie movement. When all the hippies, and I didn't like them at first just because of what they looked like on their album. It was two sisters and a brother, Matthew Ward, one of the most amazing tenors I have ever heard. But he had long hippie hair. And because he had long hippie hair, I was very, in a conservative Southern Baptist church, and I looked at their albums and I thought, oh, they look, just look like everybody else. And I didn't listen to them for years until I heard some of their music. And honestly, in my opinion, everybody, music is an opinion thing. Some music appeals to some people and not to others. But in my opinion, they had some of the most anointed music that I've ever heard. I mean, they sang, and, and it moves my spirit in amazing ways. And these two, they, they sang songs that Annie Herring, the oldest sister, wrote and they, they would sing with amazing harmonies and Matthew Ward was able to weave his voice in and out of these other voices. But the, one of their most famous songs was the Easter song. How many of you know the Easter song? Hear the bells ringing, they're singing that we can be born again. That was written by Annie Herring and it was performed by the second chapter of Acts. And they came to Reading and they did a concert and they began their concert in an amazing way. They asked the city for forgiveness. They came to Reading and they began their concert by saying, we want to ask you please to forgive us because the last time we were here, we were more concerned about our performance, we were more concerned about the business of what we were doing, and we were not operating in the spirit of the Lord and we want to ask you to forgive us. 
And it seemed really a little bit weird starting a concert that way. And then they began to sing. And they got to the Easter song. And I didn't plan this. I was sitting in my seat, I was listening, and all of a sudden I leaped up, I put my hands towards heaven, and I cried out. I cried out. I think I just cried out, yes! Because for that moment, I was transformed from being there in that auditorium I was at the resurrection of Christ and I was thinking about him and I was enveloped in his life that conquered death. And in that moment of praise and worship, I was transformed. And I sprang to my feet and I offered thanksgiving and I couldn't even help it. And then all of a sudden, I, I got a little embarrassed and I looked around and everybody else had done the exact same thing. Nobody told me, now you need to worship the Lord because it's powerful and it's the right thing to do and appropriate. And after all, it's a commandment. I was just carried away in the spirit. And that doesn't even compare to what Isaiah is describing here. To be able to feel and experience and think about in worship what God has done in the past or in the future is one thing. But to actually be in his presence is going to be awesome. And because of that, it says, you will give thanks. I can, I can come around to each one of you and look in your eyes and take you by the shoulders and say to you, you will draw joyously from the springs of salvation. You will. You will. You will tell others. Pastors are always talking to the people about, you need to tell others about Jesus. But you will, if you look at this chapter, it says you will sing. How many churches are saying to people, come on now, sing. Let's lift our voices to the Lord. Let's do this thing. Let's, come on, people, come on, let's do it. But you will. You will. You will cry aloud and you will shout. This is all in your notes. These are things that this chapter says you will do. Let's look at it again. Go ahead and go down through these things. There's several of them. You will give thanks. You will draw joyously. You will tell others. You will sing. You will cry aloud. You will shout. Why? Because God forces you to know. It'll just be natural. It'll spring right out of you. Why? Because he is our comfort. All judgment of sin will be passed. God will comfort us in ways we cannot imagine because he is our salvation. All of this is just right here in the chapter. This is why we will do all those things. Thank and sing and shout and cry out. Because he is our comfort. Because he is our salvation. Because he has done excellent things. Can you imagine what it's going to be like there in the millennial reign of Christ and Jesus is actually sitting on the throne? You will be able to see him in Jerusalem reigning over all the earth and it will be a time of peace and prosperity like the world has never known. You will say God has done great things. Amen. Are we waiting on the computer? All, all the way through. All four of those. Because he is our comfort, because he is our salvation, because he has done excellent things, because he is great in our midst. He will be right here. I can look across and see Larry, and that gives me great joy. I am glad to see every single one of you here. Do you understand that when you are here, you bring joy to everybody else is here? When, I mean, somebody already said it. When we first started the service, things were kind of sparse, and they're still sparse, but not as bad as it right at the beginning of the service. And everyone feels that. Do you realize that when you just walk through those doors, you encourage everybody? I am so thankful that every single one of you are here. And like I said, I look over here at Larry, and Larry, you bring great joy to my heart. And I don't want to hurt your feelings. But not as much as looking at Jesus. Can you imagine if Jesus were just right here in the room and we could look right at him and if we needed to, we could just go up and give him a hug? <coughs> How many of you want to say, 
want to give Jesus a hug. Say amen. amen. And we'll be able to do it. And that is why we'll do all those things that this chapter says. We'll sing and we'll shout and we'll, we'll joyously draw from the spring of salvation. But now, the, the wills, the you wills of the chapter, we looked at those. And the why, we looked at those. Now I want you to consider the when. And as we look back in this section that we just did, is God not our comfort today? Is God not our salvation today? In other words, all of these things that we just said are true today. Not in their fullest sense. But is God not our comfort already? Is he not our salvation already? Has he not done great things already? Is he not great in our midst already? Amen. Then therefore... We need to stop and think about this. We will consider. We are commanded to praise him. Look at all these verses we, we can, I mean, there, there are verses, shout to the Lord, sing to the Lord, clap your hands to the Lord. All of these things we're, we're commanded, we're told to do. But the thing is, not because we're just commanded, but because it is totally right and appropriate we're commanded to do these things. And so I want to ask you a very important question. Are you going to wait? Are you going to wait till he's actually standing there physically? Well, I sing the songs, but do you really worship? I come to church, and I'm glad you're here. I already told you this. You know, church... Church is a group of people, and there's a thing called group dynamics. They study this. They have psychologists teach about this. Groups operate in different ways. There are certain people who have more influence and less influence, but the thing is, and you know what group dynamics is? It's exactly what the Bible says about the church. It's every group is a body. If you get a group of people together, they're a body. You're part of other groups rather than the church. And you know that different people interact in different ways. I bet Brother Sam, he's got a band and, and he knows that there's certain people that influence the band in certain ways. I, I mean, Laura goes to school and we got teachers in our church and you work at a job where there's a group of people and different people operate and influence the group in different ways. It's group dynamics. And the reality is, I want to tell you, when I'm up here playing, I have to look at the, the chords. I have to be really careful because unless I've memorized the song, and even the ones I've memorized, if I get too caught up just I want to worship the Lord, but I have to remember the chords too. You know, I have to remember the words too. And every once in a while, I just shoot a, a look out to the crowd, you know? And sometimes, because of what I see out in the crowd, I decide I'm just going to keep my eyes on the music. <laughs> yeah, we're singing songs of praise to the Lord, and everybody. You know? But every once in a while, I look out and I'll see someone who's really worshiping God. And I don't, I don't mean to... <clears throat> I hope this wouldn't embarrass her, but back on the back row, we do have somebody that dances in the Lord. Amen. <laughs> and you know what? She brings such joy to my heart. Man, I, if I should look out there and I see the joy dancing to the Lord, not for anybody else to see, not to put on a show, just because there's joy in the Lord. And guess what he does to me? It lifts up my joy. And when I look out and someone's got their eyes closed and got their hands up worshiping God, it brings me into his presence and it encourages me. It's group dynamics. You know, the Bible talks about group dynamics. The Bible says that we each provide something to the body. And the body needs every single one of us. The body needs us. And when you really worship it, when you really are praising God, it helps me to praise God. When you are singing with all of your heart, the person next to you is willing to sing out a little bit more to the Lord. And you know what? If somebody every once in a while shouted, 
Yeah, at an appropriate time. Not just, wow! I'm not saying do that. But I'm saying, I'd say some pretty exciting stuff sometimes. Amen. And somebody ought to say, yes! Yes, Lord! Everybody say, There's one last blank. Go ahead. The when. All these things are true today. All the reasons to pray. Oops, I've got a little spelling problem there. All these things are true today. We are commanded to praise God. Every The reason to praise are all true today. The reasons we will praise him in the end times when we're in his presence. Yes, it's not fully revealed yet, but... He is great in our midst. Is God not great today? Can you Amen. tell me? Is God great? Amen. God is great. Is he in our midst? Amen. He is in our midst. Everybody say, God is great. God is great. He is in our midst. He is in our midst. If we respond to him, it will help others respond to him. Now, this is true in our daily lives as well. I'm not saying go out there and put on a show. I'm saying we need to learn to live our lives responding to God. I mean, there are times that a little bird will land somewhere, and I see that little bird, and it'll make me laugh. Who did that? God did that. I've got a chipmunk, or not a chipmunk, but I've got a tree squirrel that I feed at my house. My wife hates it. But I love my, my squirrel. You know, God made that squirrel. I, you, these are silly things, but do you understand that God has surrounded us with evidence of his creativity and his greatness? And, and if we would recognize, in all your ways, acknowledge him. When we look at the sun, say, thank you, Lord, for the beautiful sky. When we look at the clouds, thank you, Lord. When the rain comes or whatever happens, in all your ways, acknowledge him. I want to ask you, are you going to wait if when we are fully in his presence, we are going to be totally unrestricted in our expressions of love and praise and worship and thanksgiving? Are you going to wait till then? No. Don't wait. Don't wait. Let's do it now. When we sing, let's sing with all of our hearts. Let us worship him with our eyes and our hearts and our minds and our spirits focused on him. Let us give him thanks with grateful hearts. Let us not hold back. Let's do it now. And so we're going to end with our service with one of my favorite songs of worship, Holy is the Lord. I want you to stand and let's sing to God and realize he is here. He is here. And he hears us when we sing. He hears us when we worship him.
praise you. You are holy and righteous and good. And God, you are mighty. You are great in our midst. Help us, Father, in all that we do to acknowledge you. Lord, to see you for who you are. And to lift our voices in praise. Whether we're surrounded with your people or whether we're surrounded by those who don't know you. Help us to bring honor and glory to you with the voice that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.